okay? Okay, good. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. I am, uh, I am checking in uh, to Fort Worth from the distant country of St. Louis, uh, where I am happy to report that the St. Louis Cardinals are not World Series champions. Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, congratulations to the Rangers. Uh, I'm a big Rangers fan. I was proudly wearing my Rangers championship gear uh, all throughout the city of St. Louis for the last couple of months. Uh, but it's nice to be back in friendly territory uh, every once in a while. Uh, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to spend a, a semester studying abroad in England. Uh, my university had a, a program where I could go over there with fellow students and we could uh, spend a semester just kind of soaking in the country while we were uh, taking in our studies. And during the week, our schedule kind of looked like a normal college life. We would read books and go to classes and write papers and hang out with friends in the evening. But on the weekend, we had what was called free travel. And it's just what it sounds like. You, as long as you had a buddy, you were free to travel literally anywhere in the world that you wanted to, uh, finances permitting, of course. And uh, as I was preparing to go on this trip, I began making a, a list of places that I wanted to go, both in England and uh, throughout uh, Europe. And near the top of my list of places I wanted to go in England was Stonehenge. Uh, if you don't know the word Stonehenge, I'm guessing you do, but if you don't, I am sure that you have uh, seen Stonehenge before. Here's a picture of Stonehenge, okay? Stonehenge is this uh, uh, extremely iconic uh, uh, site in England, uh, and, and really in, in the entire world. And when I look back, I'm not exactly sure why I wanted to go to Stonehenge in the first place. Uh, I, I don't know why that was important to me. I knew that it was old. Uh, it was probably built uh, up to 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, I knew it was mysterious. Nobody really knows what it was made for. But more than anything, I think my motivation was, I need to see this for myself. I'd seen pictures of it my entire life, and I wanted to see it for myself. So one of the first weekends uh, in England, I grabbed a group of friends, and I said, okay, we're going to, we're going to go to Stonehenge. And so uh, we, uh, uh, as you do in England, I caught a bus to a train station, and I took a train to another train station, where I took a taxi to another bus station, and then finally I climbed on board this uh, old, worn-down bus that was going to drive us into the misty hills of England to visit Stonehenge. And even though the journey was a little long and a little tedious, uh, it was beautiful. It was exactly what I was expecting. Uh, it, the English countryside was beautiful. The hills were rolling. The mist uh, was beautiful. We saw little cottages with smoke curling up out of their chimneys. And finally, we parked at the bottom of one of these hills. I couldn't quite see to the top, uh, but I could tell there was something important up there. And the bus driver let us out, and he pointed to a set of stairs that would lead us up through a visitor center and finally to see Stonehenge. And I will never forget that first moment that I saw those giant ancient stones reaching up into the sky. Because as I came over the crest of the hill, and I saw that iconic profile spread out behind me, it absolutely took my breath away how much it sucked. <laughs> I want to let you in on a little secret. Uh, Stonehenge is just rocks. They're old rocks. Uh, they were moved by people in ways we don't entirely understand, but they're just rocks. And notice, I'm not saying that Stonehenge rocks. I'm saying Stonehenge is rocks. That's all it is. Uh, if you were to go visit Stonehenge tomorrow, you would probably find a very well-meaning tour guide who would say something to you like, the formation is composed of concentric circles of silicified sandstone. That is just gibberish for it is rocks in a circle. That's all Stonehenge is. I spent about five minutes walking around the stones, and I said, yep, those are rocks. Uh, we weren't allowed to get very close. It's a protected site, so we kind of stood from a distance. I took a couple of pictures, and I made my uh, kind of disappointed way back down to the bus. And I'll admit in hindsight uh, that the problem was probably with me more than it was Stonehenge, right? Uh, the Stonehenge was the same as it had been for literally thousands of years, and I knew that somewhere deep down. But I had spent so much time waiting for this moment, 
expecting this revelatory moment where I'd walk on top of the hill and see this iconic image and my life would be changed forever. And I was expecting it to look and feel and be a certain way. And when I got there, it turned out to be more disappointed, more disappointing than I thought. My expectations didn't really prepare me for the reality. Over the last month or so, Heritage, along with the rest of the Christian world, has been observing the classic tradition of Advent, where we as Christians await and long for and anticipate the coming of Christ into the world. It's one of my favorite seasons uh, through the entire year because it captures the sense that many of us feel that we're longing for God to act in the world, to make things right, to allow us to see his salvation at hand. And waiting can be difficult, but it can also be exciting. There are so many possibilities and hopes for our lives and for the world and for God's plan that we can hold on to and cherish. But there's a flip side to this waiting, because we believe that God has not and will not make us wait forever. We believe that God's kingdom has come into the world, is present in our midst, and will break into the world finally and decisively one final time at the end of ages. Waiting will end, and waiting will eventually yield to the reality. And then the question becomes not just, what are you waiting for, but what will you do when it gets there? And what happens if it's not quite what you were expecting. Our text this morning from Luke 2 that Kimberly and Ben read for us just a moment ago is all about this instant where expectation meets reality and where the period of waiting gives way to the moment of decision and action. The passage picks up right after the famous story of Jesus' birth in Luke. Jesus the Messiah has come into the world born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, announced by the heavenly host, and welcomed by the shepherds. And beginning in verses 21 and 22, Luke tells us that Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, have brought him to the temple in Jerusalem in order to perform the various rituals and ceremonies uh, required of the law for the birth of Jewish children. These are the sorts of things that any uh, good Jewish parents would have been expected to do in these days. Uh, But that's not the most important thing about this story. Because the main thing Luke wants us to pay attention to in these verses is who the Holy Family meet while they're in Jerusalem. Uh, Luke tells us about two figures, a man and a woman, living kind of parallel lives. The first is Simeon. So from verses 25 to the beginning of 28, Luke writes, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praise God. So we have Simeon, this, uh, this righteous, prophet-like figure to whom it has been promised to see the Messiah before he dies. And then along with Simeon, a few verses later, we also meet Anna. And here's what Luke tells us about her starting in verses 36. There was also a prophet, Anna, Luke writes, the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was very old, She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. And coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Simeon and Anna are Luke's ways, Luke's way of reminding us at the beginning of his gospel that Israel, the family of God, the people of God, had been waiting and longing for a Messiah for centuries prior to the arrival of Jesus. What Simeon and Anna are doing individually is a microcosm of all that Israel has been doing, 
waiting and watching for the Lord's activity in the world, waiting for God's salvation. In other words, Simeon and Anna are Advent people, right? They're waiting, they're watching, they're hoping, they're longing, they're expecting. And Luke even mentions to us that Anna is very old and at least 84 years old. And he does this to drive home the point to his readers that this waiting, this act of waiting on God's work is, a, is the work of a lifetime. And in fact, many lifetimes. Anna is just the latest in a long line of faithful people watching and waiting for the Messiah. And so, in this moment where expectation yields to reality and hope turns to vision, the relief and the joy and the excitement in Simeon and Anna are palpable. Simeon takes the Christ child in his arms and praises God. And Anna rushes up alongside Simeon, echoing his praises and thanks. The Messiah is here. God is with us. Salvation is at hand. But if you're following along in your text or you're counting verses, you know that I've skipped over something. And it's these challenging verses right in the heart of this text that I want to sit in and reflect on for the rest of our time together this morning. Luke recounts for us not just the fact that Simeon praises God when he takes Jesus into his arms, but also what he says. And even though Simeon's words are some of the most famous and well-loved words in the entire Bible, they are also unbelievably challenging. And they undercut some of the, the triumph and relief that we might have expected this moment of encounter with Jesus to bring. Because Simeon, Luke tells us, doesn't just offer thanksgiving to God, but also a prophecy about the fate of this child and the entire world that he holds in his hands. So read along with me now in verses 28 through 35 to see what Simeon says. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul, soul, own soul too. Uh, my wife Sarah and I over the last couple of years have had several uh, close friends uh, welcome their first children into the world. And uh, we've had the blessing of getting to walk alongside them as they you know, go through pregnancy and give birth and, and welcome their, their children. And Sarah and I have gotten very accustomed to uh, meeting babies for the first time. Uh, you know, at the hospital or in somebody's home and you, you know, take this tiny little bundle in your arms and you, you hold it, and uh, what you always do is overwhelmingly positive, right? You, you coo, and you smile, and you talk in a baby voice, and you talk about how beautiful he or she is, and how much he looks like his parents, even though you know he looks like a little alien. Uh, and you, and you're, you're, you're very positive, right? You're just, you're, 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 you're building up, and you're encouraging the parents, and you're encouraging the child. It's all positive. Here's what you don't do. Uh, you don't launch into a long, rambling poem about your impending death or the salvation of all peoples. And what you definitely don't do is look the mother of the baby in the eyes and say, hey, guess what? Uh, half the people in the world are going to hate and reject your kid, and that little bundle of joy right there is going to cause you unspeakable pain. Congratulations. Uh, it doesn't go well. Trust me, I tried it on the first one, and it did not, did not, not, not work out. I said, hey, hey, it's biblical, and they didn't, they didn't accept that excuse. This stuff from Simeon is weird, right? This is weird stuff, and what, what, what's going on? Why is this Simeon's reaction to meeting the Savior for the first time? 
I think in this situation, it's helpful to keep a little bit of the historical context in mind. In the time leading up to the birth of Jesus, there was a great deal of excitement and anticipation and even agitation in the Jewish world. There was this sense among many people that God was about to break into the world in a big way, about to unveil his Messiah and about to usher in a new reign on earth where the people of God could be a holy nation with political and military and civil power. The Messiah would ultimately be one, they thought, who ruled with power and ruled with might, like a king over a new world, over, over a new world order. Excuse me. And the messianic expectation often had a twinge of violence to it. The belief that God would wipe out his enemies, that the Messiah would use force to cleanse the holy land of evil and corruption, and that Israel, under the reign of the Messiah, would at long last have the upper hand over all of her enemies, both political and spiritual. And I have to suspect that Simeon and Anna might have shared some of these expectations. Remember, Luke wants us to understand that these are two very devout people waiting and longing eagerly for Israel's consolation, for Israel's salvation. They want to see God act in the world in a big way. And at least in Simeon's case, it's been promised that he will see this consolation. He'll see it with his own eyes before he passes away. And so perhaps Simeon and Anna are waiting around the temple looking for the fireworks, looking for this big show to finally come onto the scene and set everything right. They're waiting and longing and hoping for this awe-inspiring, overwhelming, satisfying show of force from God and his Messiah. But that's not what they get. Instead of a powerful Messiah at the head of an army, instead of a shock and awe overwhelming of Israel's enemies, instead of a new political kingdom ruled with power and might by God's anointed one, they get a baby. They get a child. They get a vulnerable, fragile, easily manipulated, easily killed, always sick, always crying, screaming, wiggling infant. This is their Savior. This is their Messiah. And in this moment where Simeon's and Anna's and all of Israel's expectation and longing meets the reality of God's work in the world, they are confronted with the fact that God might be up to something far different than they ever expected. And this is what I think is going on with Simeon's prophecy. Simeon, full of the Holy Spirit, recognizes in this moment as he holds the infant Messiah that his expectations and Israel's expectations and the world's expectations weren't quite right. Simeon, re Simeon realizes that the salvation he sees, this light to the Gentiles, this glory of Israel, has come into the world softly and quietly and vulnerably, no louder than the cries of a baby. And moreover, that because of the way God's salvation has entered the world, many people won't be able or willing to accept it. When Simeon says in verse 34 that Jesus will cause the falling and rising of many and that he will be a sign spoken against, I think he's gesturing to the fact that God's work in Christ is so unexpected and so counterintuitive to the way of the world that people will be shocked. They'll be offended. They might even be angry. This isn't what we were expecting. This can't be the way God has chosen to work. How can this be the source of our salvation? The messianic hope that so many people held before Christ was in many ways just a mirror image of how the world actually worked. It was about power. 
It was about authority. It was about dominating your enemies. It was about appearing invincible. And it was about winning. But Jesus' way of entering the world and God's way of bringing salvation through Jesus is in every way the opposite. Jesus' way is about weakness. It's about the relinquishment of authority. It's about submitting to enemies. It's about becoming vulnerable. And in the cross, it's about losing. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus later would say, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Simeon's prophecy points to the fact that there is a single thread running right through the middle of Jesus' life from the appearance in the world, from his first appearance in the world, all the way to the cross. And Simeon's words anticipate what both the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself will say, that Jesus will be a stumbling block to many, precisely because his way is one that isn't a recipe for success. It doesn't participate in power games. It doesn't participate in the violence and domination of the world. It's a way that's like a child, that is a child. It's a way that leads to suffering and rejection and the cross. It's the straight and narrow path that too many people will find unappealing and impractical to journey along. Jesus, in other words, isn't the Savior that Simeon or Anna or anyone else really expected. And after over 2,000 years of the church and Christian history, or about 2,000 years, I'm still not sure that Jesus is always the, always the Savior we expect him to be. This was driven home for me a few years ago when I was preaching on a sermon text at a congregation about uh, Jesus' uh, Jesus's arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you know this text, Jesus is arrested the night he's betrayed and he's uh, handed over to the authorities to be killed. And I pointed out that in this text, uh, Jesus uh, completely rejects acts of violence. He allows himself to be overcome by his enemies. He rebukes his disciple, probably Peter, who tries to fight back, and he says, uh, no, this isn't how we're going to do things. And I suggested to the congregation that Jesus' way is a way of peace. It's a way of submitting your, to your enemies and even taking on the risk of losing and losing your own life. And a kind man came up to me after the service, and he took me by the shoulder, and he said, Ethan, do you really believe that? Do you really think that's what Jesus wants us to do? And I said, yes, though I'm not always very comfortable with it. And almost with tears in his eyes, he looked at me, and he said, I just can't believe that that's what Jesus would want me to do. I don't know that I could ever do that. And I didn't take, and I don't take, this dear brother's admission as a lack of faith. Uh, in many ways, he was probably being more honest than I was. But I think his response captured what many of us feel, even if we are professing Christians. We look at the way of Jesus, and we see how small it is, but also how demanding, how vulnerable, how impractical, so counterintuitive to the way the world works, and, and we recoil a little bit. We hem and we haw and we make justifications, allowing ourselves to imagine that Jesus wasn't quite that radical. We should interpret that allegorically. And sometimes when I look at myself, I don't think that Simeon's warning about Jesus causing many to fall and rise is about two distinct groups. You have those that have fallen over here and those that are rising over here. I think it might be a statement that applies to each and every one of us simultaneously. That every single one of us, myself included, are longing for the salvation of God offer in Je offered in Jesus Christ, and we are at once drawn by and compelled by Jesus— but also a little bothered by him. We want to step away. 
He's just not always what we expect. And at least what I do is then I try to fit Jesus into my own little boxes. Uh, I try to co-op Jesus to meet my expectations of reality. That Jesus, for instance, really wants all the things for me that I want. That I should be successful. That I should have a lot of friends. That I should be safe and secure. That I should uh, have a safe and happy family. That the political party I like should be in power that my uh, job should be meaningful and enjoyable, that I should be well-known and well-liked and authoritative. But that's not the Savior I or any of us have been given. We've been given a Savior who enters the world as a child, whose power is expressed in weakness, and whose very life stands in contradiction to all the principalities and powers of the world who only seek to dominate, control, and win. And so the question for us is, what will we do now that he's here? How will we respond to this Savior? As I read and meditated on this text in preparation for this sermon, I became more and more impressed with Simeon and Anna. I have to suspect, given what we know about messianic hopes and expectations, that they might have been initially disappointed or even fearful about Christ's arrival and what it meant. Simeon and Anna didn't get to see God establish a final powerful reign over the world. They might have feared that this Messiah looked far too unimportant, born to common laborers with few resources or influence. And perhaps they wondered, even if for a moment, if they had devoted their lives to waiting for the right thing. But instead of rejecting this Savior, instead of insisting that God's ways must conform exactly to what they expected, Simeon and Anna respond with praise and thanksgiving and open arms. They welcome this child, this savior, into their arms and into the world, and they thank God that their eyes have seen his salvation as he has offered it. In other words, they respond and trust that the savior they weren't expecting is actually the savior that they need. And this is my charge to you this morning. The way of Jesus is hard. It's counterintuitive. It's unexpected. And the means by which God has chosen to definitively and decisively act in the world is through the cross. It's through death. But the way of the cross, of vulnerability, of weakness, of sacrifice, is also the way of salvation and life. And God might not and probably will not act in the world quite the way that you or I or anyone else expects or expected. But our orientation should be like Simeon and Annas. Our lives as children of God and as followers of his Messiah should mirror the posture of Simeon and Anna. We, not, we might not be exactly sure what God is up to, we might not understand what our Savior is doing in the world, or we might question what he's doing in our lives. We might, like the Apostle Peter, be asked to stretch out our hands and be led where we do not want to go. Things might not turn out how we expect. But the secret of discipleship is that at the end of the day, our expectations really don't matter all that much. What matters is that we consistently and wholeheartedly work to welcome Christ's presence into the world and into our lives. To, as servants of God, respond in praise, respond in thanksgiving, and respond in obedience to God's plans. Because even if Jesus isn't the Savior you're expecting— even if he isn't the savior I'm expecting, and even if he's the savior the world isn't expecting, he's the savior we all desperately need. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your son who has come into the world quietly and vulnerably and sacrificially, and we pray that as your disciples, 
we would uh, follow the way of your son, follow the way of the cross, and live our lives in anticipation of what you are doing in our lives and in the world, waiting eagerly to wholeheartedly welcome you there and join alongside you in that work. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.